Hello and welcome back to another episode of Sports Speak. I'm your host, Tanyan Luce. I'm your co-host, Spencer Ripchick. So we got a little bit of snow here in State College recently and we had a three-day weekend because we had off from classes. So Spencer, how did you spend your, your extra time this weekend? Um, I got some much-needed sleep because, uh, you know, I've been out here grinding with some couple 8 a.m. classes and some 9 a.m. classes. So yeah, got to sleep in a little bit, which is really nice. How about you? Never, never a bad move. So, well, I spent the majority of my, my Friday covering the, the wrestling match with the Ohio State of the BJC, so that was quite the exciting day for me, and once again hit the slopes this weekend, so gotten a lot of skiing in, but uh, yeah, so I mean, as we start all these off, we're going to go with our favorite news of the week this week, so uh, Spencer, why don't you get us started? Yeah, mine was a little bit to our um, topic last week, uh, men's lacrosse opens the season with a 20-15 to win over Lafayette, I mean, there's not a lot of defense, as you can tell, in this game, with 35 goals scored in total between the two teams. Uh, Lafayette got out to a hot start, leading the Nittany Lions into the locker room 12 to 11. But in the final two quarters, Penn State would outscore Lafayette 9 to 3. So I mean, Penn State had nine different players score a goal. I mean, with 20 goals, you expect that in the contest with Jack Trainer and Jack Kelly, both the Jacks leading the way with four goals apiece. Um, Penn State struggled in net. Alec Fayek got the start, but he didn't do very well as he let up to, uh, 12 goals in the first half. Um, but they put in freshman Jack Fersian, allowing five goals but with six, with six saves on the day. Um, Penn State, obviously it looks like they seem to miss Nick Cardiel, who uh, is their defensive workhorse last year. I mean, and now it looks like they still have a goalie problem, which had, they had last year as well. Yeah, I was just saying, giving up that many goals to Lafayette is yeah. not exactly a great sign going forward. But uh, my favorite news of the week is uh, unsurprisingly wrestling. Since we're actually not talking about wrestling this week, I had to fit it in there somehow. So uh, I think they are now the Big Ten champions as far as the regular season goes once they took down Nebraska on Sunday. I mean, they took down Ohio State on Friday, looked pretty good doing that against Nebraska. They started off really strong. Had Nick Lee and you know, Roman Bravo Young looked great. Drew Hildebrandt looked great at 125. And then 149, Bo Bartlett kind of kind of got rocked a little bit. So it's not, not ideal at 149 for him and Terrell Barraclaw. Looked pretty decent at 157, almost got the win there. And then the typical back half of the lineup kind of looked really good. We even almost saw an upset from one of Penn State's backups, Michael Beard, who, I mean, is also returning All-American, so he's pretty dang good. But he just lost his spot to Max Dean. But he almost took down the number three wrestler in the country at 197. But there were some controversial calls, to say the least. I think I've never mm -hmm. seen Rec Hall more unhappy than after some of the calls that were made in that match. So... It was quite interesting, but uh, Penn State is your your Big Ten regular season champs. So, just a couple of weeks now till the tournament kicks off for wrestling. Yeah, and they they faced Ohio State with a couple of their big names out, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're a little bit banged up right now, but it, it seems like everyone's going to be back. I think in time for tournament season, which is really what matters when your team is good as yeah. Penn State is. Yeah. Oh, uh, so we're gonna take a trip overseas to Beijing to talk a little bit about the Olympics because Penn State has a uh, several ties to the games this year. Um, Tanya, you want to? I'll start us off with uh, just the names, a couple of the names that are in this. Uh, Caitlin Holowek, an ice dancer who attends the Penn State World Campus, is going to be a figure skating for Penn State. And Nittany Lion Jessica Adolfsson will be competing in women's ice hockey for her native country of Sweden. Um, one of Penn State's assistant coaches, Allison Kumi, will be representing the United States as a team scout. Uh, Alex Dawes, director of op operations for men's hockey team, will serve as the video coach for the United States for men's hockey. Yep, so I'm just going to do a little bit of a rundown here. I think for uh, each of the sports, I guess we'll start off with our figure skating with Caitlin Hawaii. So she's an ice dancer. She's got her uh, partner is Jean-Luc Baker. So they finished third to qualify the U.S. trials. And uh, so it doesn't look like they qualified in the final in ice dance for the team event, which was happening... Uh, what was that yesterday? I don't know. I was watching it last night, and it was pretty pretty impressive. I know, but there was an American pairing. It was Madison Hubel and Zachary Donahue who actually took gold in that event. So it doesn't look like uh, Caitlin was quite able to top top uh, just top the lineup there for the the U.S. But I mean, it seems to be a common theme in figure skating that the U.S. has taken a back seat to Russia, who is kind of the the world figure skating power, and they took gold in the team event. So I think. I think uh, Caitlin has another chance. There's a, a competing ice dance on Saturday, so she'll have to do a little bit better this time around with her partner. But, I mean, obviously making it there in a very competitive sport like figure skating is a big task. And then uh, I'll move on to women's hockey. 
I think we'll start with our Arden athlete first and Jessica Dolphson. So, I mean, Sweden hasn't exactly had the best go of things at the Olympics. No. I think they've, they've lost twice now to Japan and the Czech Republic. And they beat the host nation, China. So I'm not really sure if their women's hockey team is all that good. I don't I think, think you so get, either. You get an auto bid if you're the host nation in every sport. But uh, she did uh, put up one assist against the Czech Republic. So there's a stat there. But, yeah, not exactly. It seems like the women's hockey is just a pretty much a two-team race, which brings us back to the, the American team. And they kind of have a little bit of a rivalry with the Canadian team. It's been the last three gold medal matches in a row have all been USA versus Canada, with the U.S. winning the most recent one in 2018. So I think, uh, I mean, they pretty much just absolutely hammered every team they faced so far. I think almost both of them have outscored something. I think the U.S. is like 20-something to like 5, and the Canada is like 30-something to like 5 as well. And they're just putting up crazy stats, and it doesn't really look like anyone can challenge any of these teams here. I think the, they play tomorrow, actually, in the group stage, which is kind of a weird weird matchup where they play each other this early in the Olympics, and they're going to have to wait a while till they eventually meet up in the gold medal match if that ends up playing out like most people expect it to. So I think, unfortunately, one of the U.S.'s uh, top players and Brianna Decker broke her ankle oh, in the opener. So That's tough. Uh, not exactly ideal for the team there, but I mean, I'm sure Allison and the rest of the U.S. coaching staff will be able to sort things out. And then moving on to men's hockey, it's like you said, Alex Dawes is going to be the video coach for the team there. And uh, it's really going to be a little bit, I guess, depends how you want to take it, but it could be a little bit of a less exciting hockey Olympic kind of run for the U.S. from a standpoint where NHL players aren't really allowed to play. Mm -mm. Bunch so of I know guns. they were, they were, yeah, it's pretty much all, co not all college guys. I think it's 15 out of 25 is what it is, all college players. But I mean, the NHL players were originally supposed to be playing. And I think it was right before Christmas when all the COVID cases and stuff happened in the NHL. The NHL said, no, I think we're, we're good on the yeah. Olympics and pulled everyone out. So now it's pretty much the Russians look to be the clear above and beyond favorite. I think their, their entire team is all KHL players, which is like the, the Russian Hockey League. And it's I think pretty much considered to be the second best league in the world outside of the the NHL. So I think uh, Russia won gold in 2018. And some of those Probably players are back. Some of those players are back, and they will, they will probably do it again. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, we're just going to have to keep watching those Olympics. I, I do enjoy them myself. So to wake up to, at, like, 6 in the morning, though, to watch most of yeah, the Yeah, unless you're looking at the replays there. Yeah. Right? That's the, the unfortunate aspect. I was watching some some this morning. But mm -hmm. we'll, we'll see once they get into this finals. It's all the, the prime time mm -hmm. stuff. With, what is it, Al Michaels? And yeah. Stuff, calling some stuff. I don't know if he's doing it this year, hopefully. I remember watching stuff when I was younger with him calling it. Yeah, hopefully he gets to do some calling. That would be nice. So, Yep, but uh, I think we're going to move on to our next segment now. We're going to talk a little bit of men's basketball here. They have their most kind of anticipated game of the season coming up. It's going to be the whiteout game against Michigan. So I think uh, this probably matchup isn't quite what people expect it to be at the start of the year. I know Michigan was ranked super highly in the polls in the preseason. They just really it just has not gone right for Juwan Howard's team. And Penn State, on the other hand, is... Kind of been hovering around expectations, I guess. It's been up and down. They've had a little bit of an interesting season. But I'm going to ask our resident expert here on the basketball team some, some higher or lower questions about the matchup coming up on Tuesday. So I'm going to start us off here with higher or lower 16 points for Jalen Pickett, who's been kind of um, carrying it up. So I was a bit up and down on this one, but I eventually went higher. I was going to go lower because I feel like 16 may be too high. But then I realized how well Pickett has played at home this season. Pickett has scored over 16 points just three times, so I mean my case is not very looking looking too hot there. But two of those games came against solid teams in Purdue and Ohio State, and both of those games were at home. Ohio State is one of Penn State's rivals, and Purdue is one of the best in the Big Ten. So I feel like he'll need a big performance if Penn State wants to win this game. And obviously Michigan is one of the biggest players in the Big Ten uh, with Hunter Dickerson. So I think he'll take up away all the drives down low, and I feel like it'll allow for the mid-range jumpers that Pickett excels on to make him have a lot of points in the night. Yeah, yeah. I think I think that's definitely a possibility. I think he's averaging just 12.8 on yeah. the season. Yeah, not looking too so, hard. I mean, I mean, but I think that's reasonable. I mean, you never know how he's going to react in a, a crowd environment like that against a, a team that Penn State fans do not really like in the, the Michigan yeah. Michigan Wolverines there. So, But speaking of Hunter Dickinson, like you just mentioned, He's pretty much a beast in the paint there, so I'm wondering, do you think higher or lower 10 rebounds against a little bit of an undersized Penn State squad? Yeah, I'm definitely going to go higher. I mean, there's something this team really lacks, or Penn State lacks, and that is size. I mean, the tallest player on Penn State is 6'9", 
and Hunter Dickerson is seven one. So I mean, I don't see them having any. I don't see him having any trouble nabbing the boards against a smaller Penn State Penn State team. I mean, he doesn't average that many per game, but I feel like he's going to have a big presence in the paint against Penn State that has a bunch of little short guys, pretty much. So yeah. Yeah. So our next question, I know Penn State had a little bit of a questionable offensive performance recently against Wisconsin there, so I'm going to go. Higher or lower 60 points for Penn State on Tuesday? Um, again, I went higher. I mean, Penn State is a very decent defensive team. I feel like the, if the Nittany Lions want to win this game, it's going to be very low scoring. However, Penn State does average 65 points per game, so I think it will be close to that. But I think it will be over the line of 60 points that you have. Uh, I think another reason is Penn State usually plays really bad on the road. I mean, against Wisconsin, I think they had like like – 15 points in the first half or something yeah. and around there and then indiana also on the road they had one of their worst um first halves they had like 17 points there so uh, i feel like back at home in front of the crowd they'll be the offense will be clicking on all cylinders and all it takes is if penn state plays really well offensively you'll know it because they'll start making shots and if they don't i mean i don't think i mean they still probably could hit this even if their offense doesn't play too well yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. I mean, they have they have a number of options there. I guess yeah. with the, the guard position that can attack the basket, and I think it's been looking good. Just see, I think it's really going to kind of hinge on how John Harris plays yeah. down low there. If he can get into the scoring a little bit, maybe even get Dickinson in some foul trouble, that could be big, big for the Nittany Lions there. So this is my my favorite question coming up here personally. I'm quite interested. I know Penn State has kind of had fluctuating interest in its basketball yeah. program as far as fans go. So I know that I think they've averaged about eight thousand, eight point four thousand fans this season. Mm-hmm. So my question is for the whiteout game, higher or lower ten thousand fans in attendance at the BJC? So I'm pretty sure I've been to every single home game, even when there's students on campus and non students on campus. So I'm gonna go with higher just because I, I have something I have I know. I have been into every I mean, I've been to every Penn State game. This game is at nine PM on Tuesday, which is not very good for turnout, but um, it is the whiteout game, which is probably the biggest game of the season against a rival like Michigan. And this season, Michigan has underperformed pretty significantly. I think if this there's a season where Penn State beats Michigan, it'll be this season because I feel like Penn State's kind of a wild card at times, and Michigan is just downsloping a lot. And I think I think there'll be more than 10,000 fans in attendance, but then again, it is going to be very close, and 9 p.m. tip-off does not help. But... It is on ESPN too, which will draw on some fans. And I feel like the biggest crowd they had was against Ohio State, which was like around like 9,000. And that was at the start of the season. But I feel like this Penn Michigan game will bring them all back. And I feel like if Penn State wins this game, then the fan turnout will just go up and up. Yeah, I think at this point, is, as far as Penn State sports go, you can almost slap a, a whiteout label yeah. on anything. And it just brings brings people in the masses mm-hmm. coming to whatever sport it may be, whether it's hockey or wrestling or football. Mm-hmm. seems like they always pack out whatever arena they're in once you have the fans throw on some white. Mm-hmm. Well, we're going to turn to uh, another team that has, um, uh, to shares the BJC with Penn State men's basketball, the Penn State women's basketball team. And they've not been playing too well recently. I think they've lost their six, last six games this season. Um, so what do you think has been going wrong with uh, Penn State women's yeah, basketball? For, for me, the answer is pretty obvious. I think, I think their defense is really just kind of evaporated into, into thin air here recently. I think it's a, a giving up almost 82 points per game over their six-game losing streak, which is a, not ideal when you only average 71 a game. And especially if that's 71, it's really inflated by some of their earlier games in the season. I don't know, I think they dropped like 120 points at one point yeah. against some of the, the inferior teams that they kind of played off the start of the season there. So, I mean, yeah, there's, I think that's a pretty, pretty obvious glaring problem with the team there when you're giving up that many points. I know they played some really good offensive teams recently. I know Iowa put up like over 100 on them. Yeah, like 107. We have Caitlin Clark who's really looking like a generational player out there. It's it's tough to do that, but I think it's just, just got to be better mm-hmm. regardless of who you're playing. Yeah, I don't know. for me, I think Penn State, obviously, they can't close games. I mean, Northwestern, the other game the, day, the game the other day, is a perfect example of this. I mean, Penn State was up 66 to 58 with eight minutes left in the fourth quarter. And in the last seven minutes of the game, the Wildcats outscored Penn State 17 to four. And then another another example of Penn State not being able to finish a game is against Nebraska, where Penn State again in the fourth quarter is outscored 23 to 11. I mean, Nebraska is not notoriously the best basketball organization, but I mean, losing 23 to 11 in the fourth quarter is pretty tough. Um, what I see as a problem is either Penn State is not conditioned enough, obviously, because they can't finish the game out. Or that they lack a leader in the locker room that will bring them up and make them finish those games. 
Yeah, I think Penn State has a little bit of a facil uh, facilitation problem. Tough word there. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think uh, McKenna Marisa, obviously, great player. She's been nominated for some awards recently. And I think she's, she's doing everything she can to keep this team afloat. I mean, she's averaging over 22 a game. She's also averaging three and a half turnovers per game, which, I mean, it's not the worst number in the world, but, I mean, it's not, not really great either. I mean, the next best score is Allie Brigham, who's only averaging 9.9. .9. So there's a pretty, pretty large disparity right there as far as points go. But I just think there's really a lack of a true facilitator on this team. I know yeah. Maurice is not – she's a good scorer, but I don't think she's a prototypical point guard who's primarily focused on distributing, stuff like that. I mean, like, I think it was their, their game North versus Northwestern. They had 16 turnovers and seven assists which that is an abysmal ratio yeah. right there for your team. And I just think that they need really a point guard to step up who's more so focused on kind of distributing the ball, keeping the team under control, cutting back on those turnovers, stuff like that. And McKenna Marisa can still go kind of get hers and go score her points, but I think they need someone else to really run the offense through and just keep this team kind of just coherent on offense and slow things down sometimes maybe mm -hmm. a little bit. Yeah, I feel like this team is very young, obviously. I mean, there's only one fifth-year senior on the roster, and there's only one grad student on the roster, and the rest are all juniors, freshmen, and sophomores. So I feel like last year's juniors haven't really taken the jump to become the leaders that the last year's seniors left behind. So I feel like if they – next, I mean, next year I feel like they're set up for a really, really good team, but I feel like this year they're just not ready yet to be yeah. that – contender yeah i think they're just a little little bit far away yet and i mean i think the big 10 is also just a tough conference to play in and that's mm -hmm. one of the reasons why they're struggling i mean you have i think right here it's michigan indiana maryland ohio state iowa all in the top 25 and then you still have nebraska michigan state purdue northwestern who are all substantially above 500 so i mean that's that's a pretty good number of teams right there that are just quality opponents so you can't go out there and put out like a b minus effort on any night and hope to get yeah. a win especially when you're not one of those top teams there where you have kind of an over, overflowing amount of talent on your roster. So mm -hmm. I think Penn State's got to pick up their play a little bit, and if they put things together, they maybe have a chance to beat some of these teams, but I think they're still yeah, a, little, a little bit away, like you said. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so, too. Well, I think that's all we have for this episode. Uh, if you're, darn, for this week's episode. Or this episode. All right. <clears throat> Well, I think that's all we have for this episode of Sports Speak. We'll be back with another episode next week, like usual. If you like this podcast, please consider subscribing to the Collegian YouTube channel. Thank you, and have a good rest of your week.